Okay, this is now um, chapter six of the book, you know, Poor Man's Way to Prevent Dementia. And this chapter is about exercise. So uh, I'm going to try to show you some pictures in the second half of it if I'm able to. Uh, that might be of interest to you. <clears throat> okay, so exercise is great for the brain. The purpose of the brain is more for exercise than it is for anything else. Um, you know, we move around. We navigate the world. Okay, when you exercise, you increase BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic growth factor, and that helps you to grow new neurons. Um, growing new neurons is called neurogenesis. Growing new synapses is called synaptogenesis. Whenever we learn something new, we connect it to something we already know, and that uh, gives us a reference point in our brains. Um, so one of the best things you could do to maintain cognitive function as you get older is to keep exercising. To a large extent, the brain and the body are a use it or lose it. So if you don't keep moving and exercising and doing things, you could lose that ability. All right, so we talked about neurogenesis, making new neurons, synaptogenesis, making new synapses. There's a great video of this Stanford guy, maybe I'll link to it below, showing how neurons, they move around and they try to connect with each other. It's kind of interesting. Okay, the brain also stores glycogen. It's called glycogen supercompensation, especially in the astrocytes, and provides more energy for the brain. And you also developed intellectual endurance. For example, every medical student can tell you when they first started studying, you know, it was a challenge maybe to study three hours a day. But with more and more experience, five hours, six hours, seven hours, ten hours, becomes pretty easy. Okay, the brain... Also, we'll have, as you study more and you exercise more, you'll have more mitochondrial biogenesis, the formation of new mitochondria, again, increasing the energy capacity of the brain. You'll also get a good, a good version of what is called angiogenesis, to build new capillaries on your brain. As you build brain tissue and brain tissue is more active, you'll supply it with more blood vessels. So this is a good form of angiogenesis. Um, Exercise also increases insulin sensitivity, which is a very good thing. It'll cause the glucose type 4 transporters in the skeletal muscle to move from the cytoplasm up to the plasma membrane. So that enables the glucose to enter the cell. So improved insulin sensitivity is a good thing. It helps prevent diabetes. One of the things that I like to do is, um, you know, it depends on the house. If I'm home by myself, I can play an audio book and walk around in circles listening to it nice and loud while I'm eating. Because each one of those things, you know, is a different task. You know, walking is a physical task. Eating is a visceral task. Visceral means like your organ system, your digestive tract. And then listening to the audiobooks, an intellectual task. So I don't multitask where you use the same part of your body or brain for, a, for two things at once. You can't do that. But you can do a visceral thing, a motor thing, and a cognitive thing all simultaneously because they don't really affect each other. And that's a very enjoyable thing to do. If I was like rich and I got to live another life, it's nice to have a family to visit, but it would be nice to have like my own house that was connected so I could have my own place to do whatever I wanted. Play audiobooks loud when I feel like it, sleep when I feel like it, make the house warm over there when I feel like it. You have to, you know, compromise a lot when you deal with a family to make everybody get along. Okay, um, it tones our body, improves our physical appearance, our self-esteem, all good, good, good things. Longevity, you know, the more grip strength you have, the healthier you have, your higher VO2 max exercise capacity, those all correlate with increased uh, lifespan, longevity. Um, exercise helps to activate the maintenance pathway, something called the AMPK pathway, adenosine monophosphate, you know, or activated protein kinase pathway. The bottom line is that's the maintenance pathway, the rest and restore pathway. And it's sort of the seesaw, you know, opposite of the mTOR pathway. mTOR is mammalian target of rapamycin or mechanistic target of rapamycin. And that's all about it's a nutrient sensing pathway. When it has all the nutrients it needs, like a contractor getting ready to build a building, it says, okay, tell the cell to replicate, tell the cell to grow. And so if you're a 20-year-old bodybuilder and you want to build your muscles faster, you're going to want increased activation of mTOR. mTOR's rate limiting step tends to be like the branch chain amino acids like leucine, which is much more common in meat. So 20-year-old bodybuilder, you'll get a little bit faster muscle development from the meat. It'll also have a little more creatine. It has other things in it, let's say red meat, that activate mTOR. The iron in there, the saturated fat. So, you know, if you're 20 years old, a little bit of that might accelerate your rate of muscle growth. But when you're older, the negative downside greatly outweighs the positives. Um, when you're sort of <clears throat> activating mTOR, you're accelerating the rate at which you reach the Hayflick limit. Hayflick was a molecular biologist 
microbiologist, and he worked with human tissue cultures, and he found that somatic cells, body cells, not germ cells, you know, they are uh, not stem cells. They'd only divide about 60 to 70 times. So if you're speeding up the rate at which the cells are replicating, you're speeding up the rate at which they reach the Hayflick limit, their maximum number of cell divisions when they just go into senescence and die. The reason is because every time a cell divides, its chromosome shortened because uh, they don't have telomerase, uh, these regular somatic body cells. And so they start to shorten the chromosome into genes that they actually really need to live. And that's why they... Um, can't keep dividing, you know, indefinitely, infinitely. Okay. Okay, here's just a picture of, you know, what this looks like. The seesaw metaphor for uh, mTOR is the growth pathway. So all these things associated with that. Obesity, sedentary, you know, eating a lot of animal protein, meat, estrogenic chemicals. They sort of push you into this uh, mTOR activated uh, phase, if you will, versus a sort of a maintenance phase, which is where you want to spend more of your time after exercise. And you go to the AMPK pathway, and you know starch diet helps you to spend more time in here. Just animal protein in and of itself, like I said, it's anabolic to some extent. You don't want that. And you're also going to when you eat you get increased insulin-like growth factor. You don't want that. Um, complex carbohydrates, same thing as starch. That's a better diet to keep you healthy for the long-term uh, phase of life. Get your sleep your melatonin, you know, your love, support system, friendships, oxytocin, have a purpose, religion, graduate, all this stuff keeps you healthy and happy in the long run, okay? I'm going to spend more time there, and it slows the growth of cancer. Okay, you want to slow down mTOR. We talked about telomerase, shut, uh, shortening the chromosomes. If you don't have that, telomerase builds them back up. Uh, lowering your stress rate also helps to slow the rate of chromosome shortening. Uh, Dean Ornish did some research on that. AMPK tells us, look, we're kind of tired. You just burned through a lot of ATP when you are exercising. Give us some time to restore our ATP and energy stores, okay? So that's kind of like what, M what AMPK is doing. All right, so, okay, so that's all I've got for this chapter on exercise, except now i got some pictures. I'm going to see if I can show them to you. I don't know for sure if I can show them to you. I think I can. Um... Let me just try this trick here and see if I could uh, get this to work. I think I can do it. Um, I gotta activate the slide here. Okay, let me start from the. F oh crap! I should have. Uh, I gotta go to. I gotta do one little trick here to to get it to work here. I'm gonna go from this slide, and now I can do it. Okay, sorry about that little wait there. All right, I think I think I'm got know what to do now, and I can maybe do this in the future now that I see how to how it works. Okay, so here's a slide. Sorry about that little delay there. Um, these are guys running cross country. I ran cross country my senior year because I had an injury on my shoulder. I couldn't wrestle, um, and I was very sad and frustrated about that. A fractured collarbone. And that was me in high school, and I can tell you the average SAT score of our cross country team was about 1,200, number one percentile. All right, uh, this guy actually ended up going to Stanford. And he was a plus student at Stanford, the hardest, most difficult class, physics, calculus, you name it. And I actually, he taught me a lot about studying, and I learned from him. These other guys, this guy is valedictorian of the high school. These other guy, I know he got in the 700s on his math. These other guys are really smart too. So what I'm trying to say is, runners are smart. Cross country runners are smart because I think the same discipline it takes to make you push yourself, you know, to run three miles at a fast pace is the same discipline to make yourself study, to delay gratification, and just sort of overall be <laughs> successful in life. Um, so anyways, runners, um, and I spoke to Ruth Hydris one time, and she said, you know, she never saw any of her uh, long-distance running friends uh, become um, cognitively impaired, okay? All right, so now i got to go to this one. I think this is it. Yeah, there's just a picture of me in college, um, you know, I was just a wrestler. I didn't really didn't lift weights that much, but I lifted a little bit. And I think my senior year, I bench pressed for at a weight of about 170, 345 pounds. And what I'm trying to say is, I never took a supplement of any kind whatsoever. I think the big difference, I didn't have a cell phone in my front pocket, microwaving my balls like all these young guys. All these young guys are taking all these protein supplements and who knows what else, but then they keep their cell phone in their front pocket. Pretty stupid. Okay, that's when I was a little freshman at Stanford alone in my room with a calendar counting the days waiting to go home. Okay, um... This is when I got fat. 
when I was fat in my mid 30s and uh, oops sorry about that and so I moved houses and what I did was I moved to a house I knew I was going to be stuck being a fat man and get sick if I didn't do something drastic so I moved to a new house that was like designed by me for exercise and they had a swimming pool I maintained the pool every day I, I went from 220 got down to 154 pounds um, <clears throat> real fast and that took you know I don't know about a year or so um, and now I try to just move whenever I can have a standing desk when you're working uh, walk more when the phone when you answer a phone call stand up to answer the phone call always take the stairs wherever you go park your car farther away from wherever you're going whatever seems like it's a good way to go just keep moving um, and then do something intense at least once a week if not more often than that you know whenever I'm given a choice of stairs or elevator I'll take the stairs and I'll try to go fast for example um, another thing too is I used to like to walk around and read the way my old house was set up <clears throat> I was a little bit partitioned from the rest of the family so I could walk and read and or I could listen to audiobooks I've had a lot of times experience that I'll be reading a book and spacing out but if I start walking then uh, my concentration improves because you're alert when you walk you know an animal has to be alert when it walks to survive avoid obstacles you know navigate your path etc and so I would like to read and that was a real helpful thing um, where I, would, where I would walk around like this and I would eat my dinner while I'm listening to an audiobook. Um, and I used to like doing that when no one else was home or no one was you know, near where they would hear me. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. It takes me a little while to figure this out. So my old house, I had it set up. We had a pool. I maintained the pool every day. The kids loved it. Uh, everybody loved it but the wife. The wife was progressively getting pissed off about all the maintenance involved in this stuff. Um, I had a basketball court. I had a, a jungle gym for the kid. I had animal enclosure. I designed the whole thing, and I loved it. It was like it was like a farm, and it was like a gymnasium. It was like a health club. The whole thing, I thought, was just magnificent. I loved that house. Um, and I'm going to show you, though. I pushed my luck, though, too far. Okay, I had a tennis a wall, and I set it up with a net behind there. So we'd hit tennis balls all the time, play basketball all the time. It was like the best house I've ever seen for exercising. Okay, but then where I blew it, I kind of went too far. I actually took upstairs bedroom. I turned it into a racquetball court. Um, it was great. It was great for exercise and working out. So what happened is I came home from work one day. My kid, I think he was like sixth or seventh grade, he says, you know, Dad, you're a bad parent. And I'm like, oh, well, why are you saying that? And he says, because you don't help me with basketball. He wants to go on the basketball team, and he was like seventh man, not starting. He was kind of sad and pissed off about it. And one of the other friends, his dad was a coach. Another dad was like assistant coach. And another one's helping his kid, you know, to practice. And I'm like, well, buddy, let me see what I can do to help you with your basketball. Let me think about it. Okay, so we weren't using our living room for anything. Had a high ceiling, wooden floor. I figured this would be a perfect basketball court. So while my wife was at work, I didn't ask her because I knew if I asked her, she would say no. I uh, moved the furniture out. We had another storage room to move the furniture into. And then I had my friend, he's a carpenter, boarded up the windows, put the basketball court in there, moved all this furniture out. And we had an ba indoor basketball court. The kids loved it. My kid would play for hours every day. He got really good. My wife, as soon as she saw it, she went crazy. Because you said you're, you're breaking the foundations of the house, you're lowering the property value. She went apeshit bananas, and um, all the kids loved it. And the younger kids would ride their bicycles inside there. This was many years ago. It was my old house. Uh, so anyway, she went nuts. We almost got divorced over it, and she decided then to buy a new house. And I had a choice to stay with her or stay in my old house. I should have kept the old house. I went with her because I felt bad for the kids. I figured the kids. You know, they do a lot better when there's a father around. Kids grow up better. But all I'm trying to say is this is the effort I went through to exercise a lot. And I loved it. And I wish I had kept that house, man. The kids would have wanted to come with me when they got older. But they would have had a lot of years away from me if I had done that. This is all many years ago. So, anyways, that was uh, my exercise routine. you got to keep moving. Now what I do is I lift weights a lot. Um, you know, like I just did squats, 165 for 50 reps, a typical weightlifting thing for me. And high rep squats, you get a lot of endurance out of that as well. And I lift weights with all this stuff. We have a wrestling man, you know, my nephew's a pretty good wrestler, um, etc. Okay, anyway, so you got to do something to keep moving. Whatever you like is good. Um, this is a safety squat bar, so if you have problems with your shoulders, you can still squat with this. Squat's a pretty normal, simple movement, it's just like getting up from a chair. Uh, so, anyways, uh, hope that was helpful. Oh, actually, I got one more thing I'm going to show you. You're, you're going to laugh at this next thing. Okay. 
Uh, let me see if I can get this next thing to work here. Okay, so what this is about was um, I was I was getting mocked by some young guys who were lifting weights, and um, they told me, you know, you got underdeveloped in here because I can't bench press because I had an old shoulder injury. So I said, well, I'll, I'll have you guys a push-up contest. And at the time, I could only do 48 push-ups. This was about six months ago. So I started doing a whole bunch of other things, you know, using with the, the bar handles, one-leg push-ups, and all the different variants on push-ups, tricep press and stuff. So I got where I can now I can do 78 push-ups, which is more than any of these young guys I lift weights with. So I laugh at them. They're a bunch of clowns with uh, cell phones in their front pockets, microwaving their balls. So what I'm trying to say is I ate a low-protein diet. I don't know, probably about 10% when I measured it once. And... Um, here I'm doing a set of 71 push-ups. Uh, but what I'm saying is, you don't need high protein protein to be strong. That's all nonsense. That's all from people trying to get you to eat animal foods or sell you protein powders, just like they're trying to sell you omega-3 is more nonsense for old people. You don't need that. Though. All the blue zones and other you know traditional epidemiological populations don't seek that out. All right, so I got 71 that set. So anyways, that was on the wrestling mat in the basement. So anyways, I hope that was interest uh, to you.